Lights, camera, action! <laughs> we have like one of those like paper things that's like that goes fuck. I do actually. <laughs> Quiet on the set. Action! Action! When is breakfast getting ready? <laughs> That's about it. <laughs> in the Clark home, kitchen conversations sizzle in life lessons. <laughs> Handed down from father to son. Generational wealth is property or money that you pass down for genera um, generations to come. Even at just 10 years old, Jackson knows. Okay. Dreams are free, but wealth takes work. <laughs> the first step, Woo! setting down roots. It's been four years since the Clarks bought this Columbia City home. The homes are selling for over a million dollars. I'll go rinse this off. Okay. But while the Clarks were renovating. Put in a new kitchen. A home appraiser sent by their mortgage company told them the value of their home had gone down. My agent asked me, how was the appraisal? I was like, oh, it came in really low. He's like, oh, what was it, 800, 900,000? And I'm like, no, no, it was in the sixes. $670,000 to be exact. It was quite amazing to have an appraisal that low in this neighborhood. Earlier this year, Seattle real estate prices hit record highs. So Joe's appraisal seemed questionably low. According to Zillow data, the typical home value in Joe's neighborhood this spring was over $900,000. I just want to make sure that we get the fair market value for the home. So Joe staged an experiment. He scheduled a second appraisal and asked his white neighbor, Marta Ewell, to be his stand-in. The objective was to see if you had a person that was not someone of color in the house change the amount that he got for the appraisal to see if there was some kind of bias there. Here we have the African art. I took these down as well. Joe began the process of what he calls whitewashing his home. This one here is a picture of my grandparents. It's a picture of my daughter at Christmas time. I took him down for the second appraisal. And this time when the new appraiser came weeks later, they saw Marta's white face instead of Joe's. The second appraisal came back over $300,000 higher than the first one. We got the lower price and the neighbor got a higher price than what the house is worth. Wait, what? Yeah. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? That's a bad thing for us. Yeah. But I was mad that, that we had to go through that in order to get him an appraisal that was in line with what the rest of the neighborhood has. Because it is part of our systematic racism that we have here in America. We took a closer look into the differences between the two appraisals to find out how they could be so far apart. It's taken away our generational wealth. We know appraisals are largely based on what similar homes in the area have sold for, but... There's no set standard of what that is. Where they draw those lines differ. And that can be a problem. Dr. Junia Howell is an urban sociologist and race scholar who studies home appraisal disparities across the country. Am I surprised by this case? I've seen a lot of them. They're not an anomaly. Take a look at Joe's first low appraisal from April. To assess the value, the appraiser chose comparable or similar homes that had sold up to two miles away for around $600,000 over the previous six months. Now look at Joe's second appraisal. It took into account some homes nearby sold for more than a million dollars, including the home right next door to Joe's. Using that critical context to compare, the second appraisal was $300,000 higher. Homes in communities of color are worth 70% less on average when holding everything else constant as homes in white neighborhoods. It's really insane. That disparity adds up. A recent study by the Brookings Institute found the appraisal differences amounted to roughly $48,000 per home or $156 billion cumulatively in majority black neighborhoods. Because our black and brown families' homes are often devalued, they're often taken away from us. Joe and his family are navigating a system that is deeply rooted in documented racist rhetoric. Appraisal manuals from the 1930s all the way to the 70s had perpetuated the belief that race was linked to value. Look at this manual from 1946. They ranked, in their words, Negroes and Mexicans at the bottom of this list of who brings value to a neighborhood. At the top, white Europeans. That's racist and 
historically deeply problematic and contemporarily affecting real people's lives in ways that we can collectively push against and say we want and we demand better. Such discrimination became illegal under the Fair Housing Act of 1968. But while the manuals may have changed, the diversity of the people determining home values hasn't. According to the U.S. Department of Labor, 96.5% of appraisers are still white. We have to have those conversations about race that most other white families do not have to have. He wants me to um, be successful in life. We're fighting for the next generation. For Joe, that means not worrying if the color of his skin will impact the value of what he can pass down to his kids. So I wouldn't have to struggle or minimize those struggles as a black man in America. Nice. Several states and Congress are now considering legislation that would deal with these appraisal disparities. So far, Washington not on that list. If you feel like you've received a bias home appraisal, we have information about where you can report it. Text the word HOME to 206-448-4545. For Facing Race, I'm PJ Randawa. The home ownership gap is worse today than it was in the 1960s because fewer black families own homes compared to white families. State data shows only 31% of black families in Washington own a home. On the other hand, the white home ownership rate is more than double that. Owning a home can be hard. When I got the house, it was like Keisha. Don't you lose that house. For Keisha Credit, keeping her home was even harder. What is that? My grandpa was super cool. <laughs> he always wanted to do videos. Well, you got it. Two years ago, Keisha's grandfather passed away and left her his central district home. It had been in their family for half a century. Getting his house means that he's not here, and doing this without him was one of the hardest things I ever did. The day after her grandfather's funeral, she received the first of many letters that were persistent and predatory. The next day comes a letter saying, we want to buy your house. She says they offered her $800,000. That's low in a neighborhood where some homes are selling for up to $3 million. So the business coach and entrepreneur turned to TikTok to share her experience. They feel like, oh, these black families are going to lose their house the minute that somebody passes away and let me be the first one to jump in and stake my claim. Not realizing that some of us know what the is going on and we are not telling. She's teaching others to spot the same scams and tricks used to push people of color into selling their homes. There's all these tactics that they use to try to scare you to feel like you are not able to stay in your land. But those lowball offers were just the beginning. Soon Keisha's mailbox was full of legitimate looking collection notices, claiming she was behind on her property tax or owed money to the IRS. When I started to get letters, I looked into it because I'm like, whoa, how did that happen? Was there something I missed? And then that's when I understood like, wait a minute, this is not real. Their goal is to either get you into a terrible loan, sign over your house. It's basically fraud, right? I mean, this is completely misleading information. Dr. Angelique Davis is a professor of political science and African-American studies at Seattle University. These are very predatory practices. We've seen the effects of that with gentrification. Keisha knows what losing the home would cost her in the long run. So to think that we can sell now, get something, go somewhere else and continue to multiply that, the opportunities are very low. Once that wealth is washed away, it's not easy to start over. My room was up top in the attic. Just ask Katisha Atterbury. A lot of nostalgia. This house in Rainier Beach was her family home, purchased by her grandparents in the 1960s. Growing up, it was fun. There were a lot of blacks in this neighborhood. It just brings back a lot of memories. Those memories dried up when Katisha was a freshman in high school. She says her parents got a predatory loan they couldn't pay back, and that changed the course of her life. The house went into foreclosure. I had plans to go to the UW, join the gymnastic team, and then go to the Olympics. That was my plan. And then with the loss of the home, that threw me off that course. I had to stay at my cousin's house, 
couch surfing, and that lasted for many years. Data from real estate experts show when it comes to buying a home, the cards are stacked against black families from the get-go. It can take an average black household nearly 30 years to save for a down payment. Compared to white borrowers, African Americans are two and a half times more likely to be rejected for a loan. That's partly because black families are more likely to have debt that banks see as risky for approving loans. I mean, it's just like these double, triple layers of racism that are happening. Not only are you paying more for a home that's being valued at less, and then you're not able to use that to help leverage to build more wealth for you and your family almost two decades and still have not been able to regain this. 15 years after losing her childhood home, Katisha is now a real estate developer, helping other black families buy homes. There's so many barriers. When you hear people say, lift yourself up by your bootstraps, what they're not taking into account is the historic implications of being a person of color in this country back in the Central District. You guys think that it is not real that people come after your property when you got something, you got another thing coming. Keisha's videos have reached millions. Well, the sentiments that I receive are, I'm so proud of you because we lost our family home. She's hoping to turn the tide. But you better figure out how you can win. And then when you figure out how to win, you better have other people win too. By helping black families navigate the challenges of buying a home while she fights to keep her own. That's the reason why I felt it worth it to save this. It's not just about your home as a place to stay. It is a generational opportunity, so you better fight for it because it matters. If you need help buying a home, we have a list of state and federal resources that may be able to help. Text the word BUY to 206-448-4545. For Facing Race, I'm PJ Randawa.